So I actually have a really new, unique position as I'm an HAE patient and then also a new physician as well. As a patient, I'm originally from Colorado. I have type 2 hereditary angioedema inherited from my mother. Um, and I've been on both prophylactic and on-demand medications as a patient since I was in high school, so multiple years at this point. Um, as a physician, I recently graduated medical school in May of 2024 from the University of Colorado. I'm now a first-year psychiatry resident at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard, in Boston. I'm specifically... Um, working to be a community psychiatrist, taking care of those who are severely mentally ill within the community. And from the HAE standpoint, I'm still involved as a patient because I have this unique perspective of both knowing how to navigate the healthcare system as a physician, and then knowing what it's like to be a patient with a rare and chronic condition like hereditary angioedema. So hereditary angioedema is a genetic deficit or dysfunction of the C1 inhibitor. It leads to a cascade in which bradykinin, which is a chemical receptor in the body, is released in excess, causing vascular permeability, which causes angioedema, which is basically just swelling, hives or itchiness, and it impacts the skin and mucosal membranes. Most patients will get swelling in their um, extremities, in the genitals, in the throat, the stomach, or in their face um, with that increased vascular permeability. The triggers, it's kind of dependent patient to patient. Physical trauma is a trigger, illness, emotional distress, hormones, medications. For some patients, they're not actually able to identify their triggers. Um, for me and my experience as a patient, um, physical trauma, illness, and emotional distress have been like my triggers I've identified. For hereditary endodema, there's three subtypes. The first is type 1, which means that there is inadequate C1 inhibitor amounts in the blood system. Type 2 is that there's adequate amounts of the inhibitor, but it's just dysfunctional. And the other subtype is called hereditary angioedema with normal C1 inhibitor, formerly known as type 3. In this condition, they have normal C1 levels and then normal C1 functioning. There's been a lot of research as to what could be the genetic mutation tied with this condition. It's kind of an exciting field as they're working through this, um, and a lot more patients are being identified. When it comes to who gets hereditary angioedema, the prevalence is 1 in 10,000 to 50,000. It's challenging. This data, though, only includes type 1 and 2. So as they do more research into HAE with normal C1 inhibitor, they're getting more information about the prevalence. It's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, meaning that if a patient has HAE and they have children, there's about a 50% chance their child will inherit it from them. But some patients, about 25%, have what's called a de novo or spontaneous mutation, meaning that they develop HAE without having had a parent who they inherited it from. It impacts both children and adult. Mostly symptoms get worse around puberty. And actually in most patients, their symptom presentation can vary with age and life's, their time of life. Um, for me specifically, I experienced worse symptoms when I was in high school, early college. And as I've gotten older, my symptoms have leveled out a bit more, even though I am on treatment. So that could be confounding. Um, but for a lot of patients, they'll see symptom changes based on their stage of life. I think there's two big things. I think the first would be testing for HAE is normally just a standard blood test. A lot of patients have delayed diagnosis with this condition, and it has a huge impact on their physical, mental, and emotional health. Um, it's a very really scary condition, and you're living in a lot of uncertainty as to when you'll have an attack next. So I think one thing would just be keeping it kind of on the differential early for physicians. If they see a patient with unexplained swelling, even if they potentially have like some um, overlapping ruling out HAE early uh, so patients are able to get treatment or they find out they don't have it. I think that'd be one thing. Another thing is just really understanding the disease burden that comes with HAE specifically, as well as other rare and chronic diseases. When you think about HAE, the symptoms in and of itself are challenging to manage. Some patients have HAE attacks from typing, um, from going on airplanes. So they're really having to modify their lifestyle in accordance with their symptom presentation and understanding how that can impact the way that they live and the psychosocial factors of their lifestyle overall. And then also understanding too how treatment can add to disease burden. A lot of patients when they go on on-demand treatment or prophylactic treatment require going to infusion centers or hospitals. These um, medications take time to administer. So really kind of understanding that balance of how the disease itself has a burden on the patient, but also the treatment burden that comes with it. 
And um, as I mentioned before, the psychosocial factors, so mental health component with all chronic diseases, really understanding how patients with HIE may be in fear of having an attack, how it may be a stigmatized condition, they may feel that they can't work or they may not feel comfortable sharing it with others. So really looking at the patient as a whole person when you're treating them. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit more, but really engaging in shared decision making with your patients when it comes to um, testing, especially like with a parent, testing their children, and then with medication regimens, making sure that you're really giving them an individualized treatment plan that works with their lifestyle. So there are two types of medications for HIE patients, like broad categories. The first would be on-demand medications. This is what you take when you're having an acute HIE attack or at the initial onset of symptoms. Um, this is either a subcutaneous injection or intravascular administration, and you would take that to prevent the attack from worsening and or lessen symptom severity. The other is prophylactic medication, and this is for teen prevention of HIE attacks. This, as of right now on the market, this is commonly a subcutaneous injection, uh, vas intravascular administration, or an oral medication. And the duration of how often these medications have to be taken depends on the med itself. Some it's daily, some weekly, some monthly. It's really dependent. But those are the two like broad categories for treatment. So as you mentioned, the poster was presented at the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and this research was funded by BioCrist. The goal of the research, as more long-term prophylactic treatments are becoming available, was really to understand what the patient preference is and what are the most important things to patients when they consider treatment op options. So then physicians can use this data as they engage in shared decision-making within the clinical practice to give that individualized treatment plan, as we discussed a bit earlier. How this research was conducted is they recruited patients on an online panel and total was 150 patients, predominantly female, a mix of type one, type two and HIE with normal C1 inhibitor. They used best worst scaling as well as discrete choice experiments when comparing um, hypothetical medications with differing profiles to determine what the patient preference is, usually as it pertains to the route of administration or efficacy. Some of the key results from this poster is that patients, the most important thing for patients when considering long-term prophylactic treatment would be the effectiveness in preventing attacks and then reducing the severity of attacks, which would make sense as we talked about earlier, HAE can have profound impacts on lifestyle and quality of life. So having those measures under control would be very important to patients and something they prioritize. Other key findings is that administration location, meaning is the medication being administered in the hospital, at home, or in an infusion center, as well as side effect profile. Those were also really important factors for patients when they were able to discuss um, what would guide them in treatment planning. Another key finding, too, is that 54% of patients preferred a once daily oral medication to a biweekly or monthly subcutaneous injection if they are of equal profile and efficacy. And that goes to show kind of that convenience element we talked about earlier and that taking an oral medication once daily is a bit more preferred than having to do a subcutaneous injection, even if it's more spread out. So the conclusions we're able to draw on this poster is that, of course, efficacy is the most important factor, making sure that the medications that's being selected reduces symptom severity and then the frequency of attacks. And other things to consider would be convenience route of administration. I know for me as a patient, that's something that's been very important to me. I have um, really struggled with some of the medications previously with route of administration frequency. So really taking that into consideration, I think I related to this as a patient. Um, another finding we mentioned was, again, like preferring oral over biweekly or monthly subcutaneous injections and understanding that convenience and how that plays into a patient's lifestyle and preferences. And the overall goal was how can physicians utilize this in the clinical setting? And I think they can use this data to really understand what have patients indicated they have a preference for and that this is an avenue to have a conversation with their patients and engage in that shared decision making so that the patients can say what they would prefer and um, the physician can give them all the options and kind of pros and cons with each long-term prophylactic treatment available. Just the big thing that is so important that I've learned both as a physician, though I'm a young physician still, and then as a patient is just the role of really listening for your patients and giving them that empowerment and that space to really engage with their care. I think at times, particularly in chronic and rare diseases, there is a sense of fear and kind of, um, they just want their symptoms to be better. So they'll 
do whatever needs to be done. But I think really empowering your patients to have a shared decision making with you to talk about what their options are, give them space to think about those options and approach the patients with such compassion and understanding that it's a challenging not only the condition is challenging to navigate, but also a lot of the treatments are challenging to navigate too. So keeping that door open for ongoing discussion, I think that's just so important. And then another thing too is um, physicians always have this opportunity to have space within the legislative realm and advocacy for patients with rare diseases. I think there's a lot more research to be done and then also um, patient access, especially for accessing these medications in a financially feasible and reliable manner. So making sure that physicians are engaging when they're able to in those advocacy efforts to better support their patients, both in the clinical practice, but as a whole as well. 